historically, we do not mess with it. If it gets messed with, it would have profound implications for the global economy and could put our financial system in the kind of tailspin that we saw back in 2007 to 2008. It's just a bad thing to do. So we're not going to negotiate on that. It has to get done in the next five weeks. So even though the continuing resolution to keep the government open lasts for ten weeks, We have to get the debt ceiling raised in five. You've got a shorter timetable to get that done. But here's the bottom line, Mitch McConnell, John Boner, myself, Nancy Pelosi, Harry Reid. We've all spoken and talked about trying to negotiate a budget agreement. And, yes, Speaker Boner's decision to step down complicates it. But I do think that there is still a path for us to come up with a reasonable agreement that raises. The spending caps above sequester to make sure that we can properly finance both our defense and non-defense needs. That maintains a prudent control of our deficits, and that we can do that in short order. It's not that complicated. The math is the math. And what I've encouraged is that we get started on that work immediately. And we push through over the next several weeks and try to leave out extraneous issues that may prevent us from getting a budget agreement. I know, for example, that there are many Republicans who are exercised about Planned Parenthood. And I deeply disagree with them on that issue. And I think that it's mischaracterized what Planned Parenthood does.
but I understand that they feel strongly about it, and I respect that. But you can't have an issue like that potentially wreck the entire. You. S economy any more than I should hold the entire budget. Hostage to my desire to do something about gun violence. I feel just as strongly about that and I think I've got better evidence for it. But the notion that I would threaten the Republicans that unless they passed gun. Safety measures that would stop mass shootings I'm going to shut down the government. And not sign an increase in the debt ceiling would be irresponsible of me. And the American people, rightly, would reject that. Well, same is true for them. There are some fights that we fight individually. They want to defund Planned Parenthood, there's a way to do it. Pass a law, override my veto. That's true across. A whole bunch of issues that they disagree with me on, and that's how democracy works. I got no problem with that. But you have to govern. And I'm hoping that the next speaker understands that the problem Speaker Boner had or Mitch McConnell had in not dismantling Obamacare. Or not eliminating the Department of Education. Or not deporting every immigrant in this country was not because Speaker Boner or Mitch McConnell didn't care about conservative principles. It had to do with the fact that they can't do it in our system of government, which requires compromise. Just like I can't do everything I want in passing an immigration bill, or passing a gun safety bill.
and that doesn't mean, then, I throw a tantrum and try to wreck the economy. and put hard-working Americans who are just now able to dig themselves out of a massive recession, put them in harm's way. Wrong thing to do. Peter Alexander Question, thank you, MR. President. You addressed I want to follow up on John's questions about the Issue that's obviously deeply personal and moving to you that is the gun issue. Apart from Congress's inaction, apart from the desire for new laws and, beyond that, apart from the gun lobby. As you noted, the pattern is that these perpetrators are angry, aggrieved, oftentimes mentally ill young men. Is there something that you can do with the bully pulpit, with your moral authority? with your remaining time in office to help reach these individuals who believe that gun violence is the way out. President Obama, no. I think I can continue to speak to the American people as a whole and hopefully model for them basic social norms about rejecting violence and cooperation and caring for other people. but there are a lot of young men out there. And having been one myself once, I can tell you that us being able to identify or pinpoint who might have problems is extraordinarily difficult. So I think we, as a culture, should continuously think about how we can nurture our kids. Protect our kids, talk to them about conflict resolution, discourage violence. And I think there are poor communities where, rather than mass shootings,
you're seeing just normal interactions that used to be settled by a fist fight settled with. Guns where maybe intervention programs and mentorship and things like that can work. That's the kind of thing that we're trying to encourage through my brother's keeper. But when it comes to reaching every disaffected young man, ninety nine per cent of or ninety nine point nine per cent of whom will hopefully grow out of it, I don't think that there's a silver bullet there. The way we are going to solve this problem is that when they act out, when they are disturbed, when that particular individual has a problem, that they can't easily access weapons that can perpetrate mass violence on a lot of people. Because that's what other countries do. Again, I want to emphasize this. There's no showing that somehow we are inherently more violent than any other advanced nation. Or that young men are inherently more violent in our nation than they are in other nations. I will say young men inherently are more violent than the rest of the population. But there's no sense that somehow this is it's something in the American character that is creating this. Levels of violence are on PAR between the United States and other advanced countries. What is different is homicide rates and gun violence rates and mass shooting rates. So it's not that the behavior or the impulses are necessarily different as much as it is that they have access to more powerful weapons. Julia Edwards Question, thank you, MR. President. You just said that you reject President Putin's.
approach to Syria and his attacks on moderate opposition forces. You said it was a recipe for disaster. But what are you willing to do to stop President Putin and protect moderate opposition fighters? Would you consider imposing sanctions against Russia? Would you go so far as to equip moderate rebels with anti-aircraft weapons to protect them from Russian air attacks? And how do you respond to critics who say Putin is outsmarting you? That he took a measure of you in Ukraine and he felt he could get away with it? President Obama, yes, I've heard it all before. I've got to say I'm always struck by the degree to which not just critics but I think people buy this. Narrative. Let's think about this. So when I came into office seven and a half years ago. America had precipitated the worst financial crisis in history, dragged the entire world into a massive recession. We were involved in two wars with almost no coalition support. U.S. world opinion about the United States was at a nadir we were just barely above Russia at that time. And I think potentially slightly below China's. And we were shedding 800,000 jobs a month, and so on and so forth. And today, we're the strongest large advanced economy in the world probably one of the few bright spots in the world economy. Our approval ratings have gone up. We are more active on more international issues. And forge international responses to everything from Ebola to countering ISIL.
Meanwhile, Mr. Putin comes into office at a time when the economy had been growing and they were trying to pivot to a more diversified economy. And as a consequence of these brilliant moves, their economy is contracting 4% this year. They are isolated in the world community. Subject to sanctions that are not just applied by us but by what used to be some of their closest trading partners. Their main allies in the Middle East were Libya and Syria Mr. Gaddafi and Mr. Assad and those countries are falling apart. And he's now just had to send in troops and aircraft in order to prop up this regime. At the risk of alienating the entire Sunni world. So what was the question again? No, but I think it's really interesting to understand. Russia is not stronger as a consequence of what they've been doing. They get attention. The sanctions against Ukraine are still in place. And what I've consistently offered from a position of strength. Because the United States is not subject to sanctions and we're not contracting 4% a year what I've offered. Is a pathway whereby they can get back onto a path of growth and do right by their people. So Mr. Putin's actions have been successful only insofar as it's boosted his poll ratings inside of Russia. Which may be why the Beltway is so impressed because that tends to be the measure of success. Of course, it's easier to do when you've got a state-controlled media. <laughs> 